We are in the RSM for the first time in six months. Last time we were here it was for Alistair Campbell and uh, Fiona Miller. So we're starting restarting with a double act. <laughs> and the last time we were with an audience, which we still haven't got, I'm afraid, but it is coming, was uh, with Jed Mercurio. Of all people. Well, I don't know what we're doing here. I though. agree, I, I know. He's our predecessor. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing here, exactly. Harry? He's our warm-up. Yeah, yeah, he's done quite well, I believe. So, now then, we, we, probably no sector has been affected more by the pandemic than the theatrical sector and the culture sector in general. I think that's fairly commonly accepted. Um, but we're not going to moan about that because basically we're here to talk about how things are changing and coming back. So that's the main theme, and we couldn't have two better people to talk about that. First of all, let's welcome um, Nicka, Nicka Burns, who you are a, what shall I say, multi-award winning producer, it says here, but that doesn't kind of do justice. And ladies and gentlemen, it's Nika. <laughs> Nika. Did you actually say? <laughs> Nika. Did I? Yes. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what happens when you're with amateurs. We've only just met. I know. <laughs> That's what happens when you're the amateurs, stick to the pros, I think. Anyway, but you have been the artistic director of the Donmar, uh, you production director of Stolmos and the Really Useful Theatre Group, and uh, before you founded Nymax Theatres in 2005, and I've got to take a deep breath to do this, because now you are running the Palace, the Lyric, the Apollo, the Garrick, the Vaudeville and the Duchess. It's actually better than that. Oh, no. it's owning them. Oh, you own and run yes, them? Yes, owning is much, like, much better. Okay, and presumably infinitely more risky. <laughs> yes, but, you know, you, theatre is a risk business, and if you don't have the appetite for it, you shouldn't do it. So. Okay, now we'll, we'll start from there, but we'll just quickly say who's the odd one out at the end, because we probably won't hear from him again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, there go. And then we've worked together before. Don't yes, worry. I know you have. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so that's Dr. Harry Brunjes, who's. Uh, did I pronounce that one correctly? <laughs> what did you say? Brunjes. I'm not going to do it again. That's it. No, I'll settle for that. Okay. Now, you're a member of the RSM. I am. Uh, you're a gradu graduate of Guy's. Um, you're a GP, uh, an entrepreneur, a jazz pianist and uh, you've actually almost be, been a musical person yourself, I believe. Is that correct? So you yeah, started out. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. Way back in the last century. Yeah, true, as we, were, as we all were. But I never worked for NIMAX Theatre. I never booked by NIMAX Theatre. No, but, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not here because you're a doctor. You're here because you're chair of both the English National Opera and the London Coliseum Theatre for the last six years. So how could we, how could we do better? Let, let's start at the beginning. So, can I just ask you, Nika? <laughs> I've done it now because I now always are going to get your name wrong. It's all right. <laughs> I know, Nika. I Nika, come on, wake up. Um, is, at what point a year ago, or just over a year ago, did, did both of you realise that the lights were going to go out? How, how quickly did that come up? It was, the, uh, it was uh, March the 16th when Boris made this announcement on the Monday and he said, um, he said, don't gather inside, don't go to the... Th don't go to the theatre. Theatre owners, you know what to do. What do you mean we know what to do? We didn't know what to do. And uh, it was a Monday and we were getting ready. Uh, the actors were already getting ready to go on. They were doing their warm-up. We had to go to the DCMS and say, what does this mean? Are we not allowed to perform tonight? Uh, and in the meantime, audiences were starting to arrive and then we got the message, you can't, uh, you can't play tonight. And I was in preview with the most wonderful show called City of Angels at the Garrick as uh -huh. a producer. And um, we, we, the director, Josie Rourke, said, well, for, honestly, Nick, at least give us a drink. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So I rang uh, the company, uh, everybody's talking about Jamie company at the Apollo, to come on down. And actually, we had a party. It turned into a party because, and we were all saying, see you in three weeks. Nobody expected that the lights were going to go out for months and months and then actually more than a year. Yeah. It really, we all believed it was a temporary thing and we were very confident and that was a particularly heartbreaking thing for me because City of Angels was, had this incredible cast. It's a, it's a beautiful, very high art house musical and we never had our press night and our run finished before we could actually get it open again. We never, it's gone. That's and that's 1.6, yes, 1.6 million pounds yeah. down the drain, and a lot of heartbreak. Harry, do you also give them? Well, a, it sounds like you're giving a pearl handled revolver. Well, you know, said you know story. what to do. Uh, I think Boris spoke at was it five o'clock that day? Yeah. And Stuart Murphy, the chief exec, rang me, 
uh, and we went to Stuart and the Main went into the theatre. We had an audience coming in that night for Madden Butterfly, if I remember correctly, and we had to turn uh, 2,300 people away. Uh, and it then just obliterated the end of our season. And very much like the big shows which, uh, which Nika puts into the palace, uh, operas just don't happen, the three years in the nah. planning. And uh, on the Saturday night before, we had opened a new production of Marriage of Figaro, and it was most upsetting that particular, we opened it, we, had, we just didn't quite know in rehearsals how it was going to work, was it going to run, was it going to, would, how would the critics like it? It was uh, an enormous critical success and it only ever saw the West End of London, only ever saw uh, on once, one outing. So, we, so we, we've now got it in store and stock, hopefully to bring it back and revive it sooner rather than later. We were halfway through a run of uh, Madame Butterfly, um, which is one of our flagship shows, and we had to, uh, we had to clo uh, close that. And the following Saturday night, we were opening uh, Rusalka, uh, which never saw the light of day either. But you're better off than I am um, with a show like City of Angels, because it took me five years to get that cast together. Yeah. And I don't know if I'll ever get it back. Yeah, I know. And I have to recapitalise it. All my poor investors that have lost their money because we were actually so close to opening, we'd spent most of it by then, which is quite proper. So it's just heartbreaking. I mean, it's not like you have a cast just sitting, waiting no. for you to flick the button and put the lights back on and they jump back on the stage. It's not like they that, They have to it? take the work where they can, particularly yeah. now, you know, because they've all got to pay their bills. And, of course, that's the tragedy of the actors were as freelancers. A lot of them didn't get any support during the whole of this closed year. So they they just desperate to work. Yeah. And, they, and, and I'm totally agree, in agreement with that. You can't wait. If I can't offer you a contract, take what you can get. Yeah. Now, on the 19th, you, I was coming with you to watch the marriage. How are you? Oh, yes. That week, I know. You've obviously well, forgotten, but I haven't. Yeah. We'll, bring, we'll bring you in for something else. <laughs> Thank because, you. Because, you know, uh, fingers crossed, uh, we'll be all bells and smiles. And that, and that production may never, may never no, come... No, we'll, we'll bring it back. It, it was back. a wonderful show. It, okay. it was terrific. And uh, very funny, so, uh, very visual. So it's been a horrible year, but we're here to talk about the green shoots of recovery and whatever cliche we want to do it. And you had a huge spread in The Observer on Sunday. <laughs> yes. You did, so you did. Yeah. So... Let, let's let's go through then. What what's it going to take to go as to get back to where we were? What are the steps that you're in now? Well, if we've got a roadmap, and we were very pleased to have a roadmap from Mr. Johnson because that, for the first time, gave us a little bit of certainty, but mm -hmm. not quite. Because although he says you're going to open from the 17th of May with social distancing, we actually don't get the green light until the week before because the whole roadmap is based on five weeks, five week tranches with the decision as to whether that tranche can happen a week beforehand. So I, my theatres are on the whole smaller theatres. Mm -hmm. um, those of, those theatre owners and producers that are doing the big shows, so your Hamiltons, your Mary Poppins, your Lion Kings, and the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which is at the Palace Theatre, these are big engines. So you can't just turn them on uh, with a week's notice. You've got to get all the actors back together, you've got to get back into rehearsal, you've got to re-tech it, and you have to get the press and marketing in. Because these shows, I mean, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child cost 300,000 plus a week to run. You can't do that with a 50% capacity. So in my theatres, what we've done, all the shows that can't come back, we, we've ha I had this idea, and this idea was that we would go to the, the new generation of people trying to make theatre, a lot of them who've produced in the Fringe or out of London, and actually turn it into an opportunity. I mean, all the way through these awful days of COVID, these hard times, I've been trying to find a bit of gold wherever I could and find optimistic things, find some hope. Uh, because always in adversity, somewhere there's that green shoot. And this Rising Stars Festival, which has... 23 young producers. Now, a lot of people go, what's a producer? What do they do? We're not interested in them. We're just interested in the actors. But without a producer, the show is just an idea. That's my next question. Explain to me, what does a producer do? Oh, well, <laughs> it, it backs all the creative team. It chooses, a producer chooses what show they, they want to do. 
Uh, and, and artists, uh, directors and writers go to them with their, with their scripts and with their ideas for a, sh for a play or a musical. And it's only when a producer goes, yeah, I'm going to do this, they can actually start to happen. Uh, they raise the money, they cast it, they, uh, they put the whole the creative team together as a whole. Uh, and they are the backbone of our industry. And what a lot of people don't know in the UK is that 80% of theatre is from the independent sector and only 20% is from the subsidised sector by the government. So in the subsidised sector there's a lot of rules and regulations, what you can or can't do because you're receiving funding. With, com with commercial stroke independent producing, it's up to all these individuals to go, I really want to do that. And then they have to make it happen. And you know, they have to come to someone like me and say, we want your theatre. And I'll look at the show and I'll go, mm, not sure casting's not good enough, I'll go yes or no, as will Cameron McIntosh, as will Andrew Lloyd Webber, as will ATG. So with these young producers, it's very hard for them to get in to have their first West End experience. It's very expensive. And they're quite right. I started off on the Fringe at the Edinburgh Festival, at the King's Head Theatre, at the Fimbra Theatre in London, and I learned everything. But you have to take the risk. You put your, your, your hand in your pocket, and you put the money you have on the table, and if it, you lose it, you lose it. And it can be a very salutary experience. Yeah, they, I must admit, they did look very young. They are very young. Yeah. I mean, the, the youngest, this delightful young woman who is 20, Habiba, uh, Amina Habib, amazing. And she's so confident. And um, it was just a joy to have uh, someone as young and as, as clear sighted as to what they wanted to do like that. And as she, she's branded herself as the youngest female producer ever. And very annoyingly, damn it, she's right, because she beat me. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't <Okay>. that young. <laughs> so what's got to happen then? I mean, we're still in a time of COVID. You yeah. know, we're constantly told correctly that, that it, it's, everything's getting better, but we're not <coughs> over yet. So what's it going to be like if I turn up on May the 17th in one of your theatres? You will come with your phone... Right. Uh, because you will ha get your tickets on your phone after you've signed a form and returned it to the box office, to, to, the, to the email site, saying that you don't have COVID and you haven't been in touch with, co uh, in contact with COVID as far as, you, as far as you know. Right. You don't get your tickets on your phone until that happens. But, and we have to have the email addresses of every single person coming. You'll arrive and you'll be socially distanced in the queue. You'll be wearing your mask. Uh, you mm. will be greeted by staff wearing masks. And I'm, I was very, very insistent on, on, our, on our masks for our staff because they say welcome because you can't see them smile. Yeah. And, um, and then you'll obviously have hand sanitation. You will be socially distanced within the theatre. We had to take all the seats out of all the stalls and reconfigure them to have the correct distance, which in a, in a theatre is a metre, with plus plus with, with preventative measures so um, that was quite a long long uh, journey to do that across all the theatres and in the, in the circles where you can't get a metre front to back or side to side uh, we have to lose whole rows and then the computer algorithm takes out a seat either side of every booking so we can only play to 50% capacity or less. If that. Mm. Yeah, because so if, the worst thing for us is that if lots of people come booking a single ticket, because for every one person oh. I lose two seats, for four people I lose two seats, if the entire audience came as a one, I'd probably be about 30%. Gosh. So you, you can't make the income. Therefore, you have to be smart and you have to put on interim programming like we've done, which is smaller shows, which are a lot, lot less expensive, but still very good. And these, these young people are putting on small shows, very talented performers. They're getting some very good names to work for them. And um, they're, going to, they're going to pull it off. And the good news is, tickets are selling. Hooray! <laughs> so we know people want to come back. And they're taking a punt on the, on the young people. But also, we've still got things like Musical Six, which is extremely popular. That'll be sold out completely. My what, Musical what, sorry? Six. OK. It's, um, it's a feminist take on Henry VIII by his six wives. Oh, um, very annoyed about being treated so badly. Yeah. And, um, and everybody's talking about Jamie, which is uh, my musical. Uh, uh, that's back. And we've been able to bring that back because we got a cultural uh, recovery fund grant to have 35 people on stage. 
Well, let's, let's, let's talk to both of you then a little bit of that. I mean, the government was criticised for being slow to react to the crisis in the arts, but it did finally in July, I think, with what sounds huge, 1.5 billion, but actually when you think about, there are, I think 5,000 uh, organisations are supported by this, not people, organisations. Well, look, to, it's How's one it of those working? things. Everybody will, everybody will ask for more. I mean, of course. Everyone across the country has been asking for more for all their sectors, but actually that was a good sum of money and uh, a lot of people have been helped. And I can only talk for myself, but I'm grateful for it. And just occasionally, it's, you know, you should just say thank you. And I think that Oliver Dowd and, and, uh, and the DCMS have worked very, very hard. They've taken a lot of advice. And um, I think, I mean, you, did you get some help, Harry? We did. And what we, um, one thing we were just talking there to Nika about, something else when you were speaking, Nika, uh, all these shows which we're, we're going to bring into now, which are socially distanced, they have added costs which you never had yeah, before. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to take these seats out. You have to bring staff in. You have to sanitise you have everything. You sanitise everything. You've now got to get a new IT software platform. Uh, there's, so it's not a question of trying to cut costs, which you are trying to do, but there's, a, there's, a, there's yeah. a whole infrastructure of added costs which never existed in your business modelling before. But back what, what you're talking about with uh, the government. Um, every sector... Had, had their concerns, but I think uh, you could say that they were slow, but in, in the scheme of things, um, and I will only speak here of English National Opera and London Coliseum and my board and uh, the management, uh, we felt everything uh, was reasonable and proportionate. Um, we, we feel well supported. We've had good access to DCMS. Uh, we have no complaints at all. One thing which was never registered, uh, really, was that we get our payments, our normal payments, because we're partly public funded. Yeah. Uh, besides the cultural recovery fund, those payments were advanced as well to help you with cash flow. So if, if you look back now at this point, um, uh, to use those two words I used a few minutes ago, we thought it was regional proportionate. We felt things were fair. It was one of those things though, is that it was uncertain from day one. You know, we were going into a genuine world crisis that mm. none of, no, no one had, had faced before this kind of virus. So, and no one understood from day one how long it would take and what needed to happen no, to fix true. it. And we seem, the answer seems to be vaccination. And actually, if you think about it, it's been extraordinary that we've had so many vaccinations so fast, mm. given how long it takes to create something new like that. So I think... It's not surprising that it took a bit of time for the government and the DCMS to come up with a saving package, but we'd already been helped because, all, you know, I'm sure you'll say the same, thank God for furlough. Furlough, which was a national thing, transformed everything. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a financial cost, but there's a massive human cost. And I, I have to have these discussions with myself all the time, you know, and which is good CEO, businesswoman, human being. And uh, in my company, I've, most of my staff have been with me from day one. And I was a risk at that time. Uh -huh. No yeah. one knew if I could do it. In fact, when I bought the first four theatres, there was a bet going round that I go bust within a year. Yes, I know, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and all the, all the technical surprised staff... surprised they gave you a year. <laughs> you surprised they gave me a year. Well, you know, it does take a bit of time to make a complete fool of yourself, Simon. <laughs> so. I, mean, I mean, you are a businesswoman. Yeah. You, you won an award in 2013, I know. You were the businesswoman of the year, I think. Like private that. businesswoman private, of the year. Private, sorry, yes. private. Okay. Well, that's the hardest bit, isn't it? It is the hardest bit yeah. because, that, again, that's, it's all about risk. Entrepreneurship, you are an entrepreneur, Harry. It's all about taking personal risk, and it doesn't suit most people. But you, you, you clearly are not, well, I'm a football fan, and we're owned by people who are clearly trying to make money from a sport we like. But you love, you are doing both. I, you, yeah. you love the sport, you clearly yeah. do. Which would you rather be remembered as, a successful businesswoman or both. as a successful theat theatrical producer? I, uh, yeah, it is both, because actually... If you can't manage the business, you can't do the other. True. So, you know, if you're, if you're a fool with money, you're out mm. very fast. And also, it's about wanting to grow it as well. You know, so that you've got to, every year, you want to do better. 
and then you have the choice about how you want to spend your money. But theatre is a is above all about collaboration, mm -hmm. and uh, I have the best staff team. I mean, the core staff, which are the the technicians, uh, they're really critical, as are my senior management team. And uh, I'm very proud that I didn't make any of my full-time permanent staff redundant. It was bad enough making the front of house staff who, in our world, when a show ends, so do they go, if it gets closed, they go as well. Those are the kind of union contracts they're on. Yeah. They're very unionized. Uh, and it was hard saying, making people redundant. Well, so uh, Penny, Penny Spinks is asking, um, talking about freelance. Yes, and terrible time. Okay, that's the answer. Is it? No, I mean, <laughs> Penny, you're right to ask yeah. about them because so many of the freelancers fell between every single goalpost that yep. you could possibly have. Uh, and the thing is, is that it doesn't matter how much money you earn. The truth is, people spend most of their money on their home. And so, you know, we've, we've had examples where um, a leading lady, for example, in one of my companies, above the title, uh, earning a good wage. She spent this year sofa surfing. She had to give up her flat. She couldn't afford to pay the rent um, because she got no support whatsoever because she was earning more than £50,000. And uh, you kind of think, 35 years old, you're incredibly talented, you always work, and here you are, you know, little suitcase, living with people who have been yeah. kind to you. And that's, that's the truth for them. So they've been the heartbreak, I think, of all of it. And it's not just actors, but it's also directors, writers, yeah. all those people who are not on a company payroll. And it, it's, it's even extending beyond that. Uh, we obviously talk about the West End and actors and singers and dancers. It accounts to um, right throughout the country, every theatre, every venue, cabaret performers, uh, cruise ships, uh, camps, <laughs> all, all. They're, they're all freelance. Yeah. And none of them are working. Mm. And it's the old adage in the entertainment world, it's no play, no pay. And it's been, it's been tough for them. And I some pe people have been very enterprising. Uh, this is one lovely anecdote I, I like to share with you, which is uh, our, mu one of our, our musical director on the tour of Jamie, um, he, he rang up and said, look, I've got a job. Let me know when you think we're coming back. And he said when he was seven, the one thing he wanted to be was an ambulance driver, driving an ambulance with the siren on through the streets. He said, and I'm doing it. <laughs> I thought that was, what a positive attitude. Now, people ask you a few practical questions. Yeah. That, oh, I, hopefully I know the answer. Nat Lawson says, will the actors be wearing masks? No. Few. The <laughs> actors aren't wearing masks because... We have a COVID testing hub uh, that we run. They get tested. Everyone from the, from the front of the stage back to the, to the stage door, technicians, actors, get tested every 48 hours. And that's why they don't have to wear masks. But in Jamie, we've, we've t we, it's a contemporary story, and they're at school, so we've written COVID regulations into the school, oh. which is quite fun. <laughs> Well, uh, in an ironic way, I suppose. Yeah, but it's, it's not real life. <laughs> and actually, okay, people yeah, recognise okay. it and they go, oh, yeah, you know, as they're playing with their masks and they're getting told off. And then, I mean, this is now my question, but I was at a funeral recently and um, we, there's no singing. Yeah. But you do musicals and everything you do is singing. Yes, I can promise you there'll be no masks when they're singing Good. Uh, opera. Um, we, we put one show on. Uh, we, well, we've had several shows, but quite a few... I'm sure some people listening may have uh, seen some of the TV we've had. Messiah, Mozart, Requiem, Comet Relief. Um, but uh, we, we put a show into Alexander Palace uh, yeah. in September. Uh, normally I said main stage opera flashed a bang is three years, but we put a bespoke contemporaneous version of La Boheme in uh, Drive and Live. Uh, three months it took us. Uh, and again, just as Nika explained, we had to rehearsals in our rehearsal rooms up in West Hampstead. We had all the squares marked out. There was bubbles, there were two teams and they couldn't mix. Uh, and the whole thing, the blocking, the directing uh, was carefully worked out. So there was no social contact on stage. Everybody sung apart. Uh, it's it hard work. It was very good. I went as an audience member, but it was a little strange when you know Mimi dies and her lover couldn't know, hold her in his arm. He's like, well, you know, kind yeah. of hovering yeah. in a socially distanced oh, okay. way. But I also watched it as well, and I know you changed the libretto a bit, didn't you? So well, we did. How how how, how does Rudolfo know that her tiny hand is frozen if he's not 
if he can't no, hold it. No, but we had to do it's that. Blue. And if you, and yeah, well, you said, <laughs> yeah. and you changed, and it looks frozen. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and that's he, cheating. He, and he, he was there, and she was in the camper van. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, um, uh, we're, up, we're up for a BAFTA today. Oh, great. Yeah, so it was, for, it is yeah. great. You shortened it as well, I think you have oh, to. Yeah, one and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, look, you can't have a loo break. It's the first time it's ever been done in the UK. Uh, we, we're, we're very proud of it and we will, it will happen again, it will come round again. But I think what, what everyone can see is that the theatre community has, has been very entrepreneurial yeah. in trying. trying to continue to make work during this time, whether it's your drive-in, uh, there have been quite a lot of musical theatre concerts also in drive-ins in industrial parks. I went to one in industrial park, it was hideous, but the show was great, so I didn't mind and podcasts and streaming and putting shows out there. So we've, everyone has actually done their best, but it has been very hard, obviously. Yeah. Now, Nat, I don't know if he's young Nat or old Nat, is still fascinated by how it's going to work. He's saying, are you actually suggesting vaccine passports? It's what, we're what, what we are expecting are COVID status certificates, right. which means that, one, you've been vaccinated, both your vaccinations, two, you've got antigens, or three, you have a current um, negative test. Okay. And actually... Not all three. One, 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 yeah, so you tick one of those boxes. Of those. I think okay. that's, quite, that's quite smart of yeah. the government because I'm trying to work out who you're excluding yeah. with that because everybody sh can take a test. Yeah. If you don't choose to, then that's your choice. Uh, so that's... Okay. And the idea is it will be on an app and they, they're working at the moment to convert the NHS track and trace. We want it to be under the NHS banner because, you know, it's the most trusted brand in Britain. Yeah, it's going to be the NHS app, I think. Yeah, yeah and so I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And you, literally, you'd come along and you'd, SQ, you, 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 yeah. you'd SQR your phone and a tick would come up and in you go. Okay. And don't you, you know, going back to that, because I think, and the feedback that we've had from audiences is that they want to go, but they also want to know that sitting next to a, sitting next to a stranger who's not going to infect them. So I think it's a very, very, very good scheme. Okay. Now, this is a think? question from... I, I agree with you, but this is a question from Simon, from me now. Bar? Bar? <gasps> we got an app! It's marvellous! <laughs> and the thing is with apps, half, most of the time they don't work. We had to, you're talking about costs. Yeah. Is that we developed a, an app. Um, we opened for 10 days when we were allowed to before Christmas. And uh, you can book your, book your, uh, your drinks at any time, even when you're standing outside. And you can do, we'll have it all ready for you to collect. So that it really cut down the bar queues and very few people were actually going to the bar. We, we've tried apps before, it's never worked. But this time, audiences really took to well, them. That actually sounds like a good idea yeah. anyway. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> well, great. I think, I think it'll yeah. be more flexible. I think we'll, yeah. we're, we're planning that you can still buy at the bar. It can come to the seat. You can buy it on the app. So maybe you won't have those long queues or those bun fights. Everybody trying to get their £20 in front of the barman. Yes, mm. that, that actually sounds genuine yeah. progress. Yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> a, maybe a, a, a good thing which comes out of yeah. progress. So what, what we're hoping, though, is that June 21st is the date where we will actually, the, the NHS app will be completed yeah. and works, because that's, there's that little bit of, bit of it, and that we would be given the go-ahead to reopen without social distancing. And so overnight, we'd be, we'd be reconfiguring all the seats back again and we'd, we'd immediately try and go to full capacity. But everything has to be in place because people, feel, people have to be safe. And the emphasis is opening safely. Yeah, I hate that word, safe. But no, but, it, but that's, no, it's a simple can, message. I know, but it, nothing's safe in this world. Well, we shouldn't I'm going to be a bit, bit, more, bit more optimistic than you, okay. Simon, because we had 25,000 customers through across the six theatres um, from December the 4th to 13th when we were closed down. And um, afterwards, we did an audience survey and we only asked three questions, which is, did you feel safe? Would you come back? Would you recommend it to your friends? And we've never had stats like that before. 95% yes to all mm -hmm. those things. And even better, we didn't have one incident or track or trace, or no one wrote to us to say, I think I became ill in your theatre. And I mean, it's, it's a bigger responsibility. We, as, as the theatres, 
want to make sure that we have actually taken care of our audiences. Okay. It's not open, open at, at any cost whatsoever. Okay. Harry, when, when are you? You've been a bit coy about when you're opening. Well, I'm not being coy, actually. It's exactly the same. We're not opening on May the 17th. Right. Um, as Nika said... You might have a tech to do. Pardon? You might have a technical to do. We have a technical to do, and, of course, it's a big, big production. So we're opening... Uh, six years ago, our funding changed. We lost some funding from the government, so we're a hybrid house now where uh, we have a sp uh, an autumn and a spring season, uh, and then we have a commercial summer. And over the last five years... We had Alfie Bow and Catherine Jenkins in um, Carousel. We had Glenn mm. Close at Sunset Boulevard, yeah. Mark and Ball and Chess. So we're going to be opening our, our, re, uh, our re-emergence. It will be Michael Ball on June the 21st in Hairspray, which is also selling well, as you and I have discussed. Uh, we are booking currently for socially distanced for that, for the, for the first couple of weeks. We're a big house with 2,350 seats. So that will equate to about 1,100, 1,150 seats we're going to be selling, they're going to be selling well, with the capacity to sell more if the regulation changes. Okay. So we're all hoping and wishing that things go well at the Crucible and uh, yeah. FA Cup final and the Brit Awards. And then we're hoping about three weeks later we will be back. That's our hope and that's our plan. But there's been nothing more constant uh, than the... The only thing we've been able to predict the last year is unpredictability. And we've had more plans <laughs> and more... Uh, Stuart Murphy and I, Annalise, artist director, Martin Bradman's music director, w there was a period where we were talking daily, twice a day, planning, changing plans. Then there's an announcement at five o'clock. We changed yeah. that. Drive on Life has to go back. We were going to try and come back in, this, in the autumn with a uh, Madden Butterfly again. That stopped. And it just went on and on and on. We're now in the stage where, in fact, uh, as you said, the green shoots are coming out the ground. Hopefully the planning is set. So it's hairsprayed for us on June the 21st, and then we will start a full opera season uh, uh, in the first week of October. Uh, we haven't announced our season yet, and we're announcing in two weeks' time, but I'm prepared to leak uh, in good political fashion. Uh, <laughs> we, you may have seen in the press, uh, we've signed, uh, which we're very proud of, um, uh, a ring cycle uh, in collaboration with the Met, the New York Met, and as a sort of a teaser, as a warm-up, um, we have a new production of Valkyrie coming in in, in October. Um, yeah. which and is, you are, Jogi, you're going to do a full ring cycle. Well, the ring cycle will be slightly atypical in as much that <laughs> okay. it, would be, it won't be back-to-back -back ring cycles. Uh, again, we work closely with yeah. the Met, we have a long relationship with the Met, and um, we've looked at it functionally, we've looked at it financially. So it'll be a, uh, a big ring cycle that we'll be doing one every year over four I years. I didn't quite mean that. I meant that the, the cast is so huge, you can't have a socially distanced ring, surely. No. 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 no, OK. And it will break... Listen, you don't just think on a Saturday you'll do a Wagner and you open on yeah. a Monday. It's very hard to get the singers. I, I, I'm in, you know, I'm, I'll be seven years in this role by the end of the year and we've been talking ring cycles and Wagner's at board meetings uh, for years. So we will be heartbroken. Are you a uh, Wagner fan yourself? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm told by a, by a spy of mine in our respective trades that, uh, yes. that you, you fell asleep in the Act 2 of Parsifal. <laughs> oh, you're so what mean! What a man. You know, this was a P40. I'd like his membership uh, removed <laughs> from the Royal Society of Medicine. The first former president to be removed. <laughs> I, I, well, I don't think that's true. I'm, I'm checking my wife sitting there. If I could be... Uh, because that was passed about, it was 2012, as I uh, just started yeah. on the board. And I'd just flown in from New York, so my, my oh, head okay. may have just dropped. Oh, but right. I, I'm, I'm going to deny that. OK. If you've fallen asleep in your lab OM, then that would be dreadful. But mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think it's quite possible to do that. Now, one question that which leads to a broader question, actually. <laughs> this is Barbara Bergstrom, who's a Canadian, obviously an RSM fan. She's coming over at some stage. Now, she says, I'll be vaccinated, but I'm not going to be able to prove it on an NHS app. So the bigger question is, first of all, how, what are we going to do about tourists, et cetera? And second, when do you expect them back? Well, I think I, she's a tourist, actually. Barbara, up, you'll be able to get in because you'll have come into the country with some sort of pass, right. whether it's what they call a, they're talking about a green pass. If you, any, anyone has a pass from their own countries, uh, we're, we're going to end up getting a whole information sheet about okay. what everybody's doing. We will let you in. I assure you, we do not like turning anyone away. No, okay. We'll be standing there saying, welcome, we yeah. want more people from abroad. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I think that's reassured her. But 
But seriously, though, you, you depend a lot on tourists. We depend a lot on tourists for the bigger shows. Yes. My kind of shows will be very much a London audience. Right. However, summer would be a disaster without tourists, and we are all really looking forward to the opening up of travel again. Mm. But again, we have to do it so that we don't... No one wants to go back to, 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 the, to having the virus spreading again and being locked down. So it's just practical, really. Do you, I mean, I'm worried that there'll be people living here who will be reluctant to go. We, we know that not everyone has flooded into restaurants and pubs, and presumably some of your audience... Simon, have you been to Soho recently? It's yeah, I, packed. I, yes, I have. It's absolutely it's packed. It's packed. packed. Yeah. And Oxford Street coming here this yeah. evening? Well, that wasn't So packed. far, when we put Mozart Reckham in the autumn, uh, we sold out immediately. Right. Drive and Life is sold out immediately. Uh, hairspray booked now to avoid disappointment. Uh, we are extremely confident that when we put the uh, open the box office middle of May uh, okay. for the four operas up into Christmas, um, you know we're not being flamboyant here. We can we are confident uh, that it's going to go well, uh, and I, I can see where the comments here. I know many people who. Are, older than myself, who said, well, that's the end of my socialising. But this, this, it's moving. The mood is yeah. moving. They're more confident with the vaccinations. Uh, they can see the statistics every day are dropping down. And, uh, and let's, just, let's just hope that continues. I, I agree. I went to church on, on Christmas Day, because the Actors' Church in Covent Garden was allowed to open. And I was highly amused by the fact that the 80-plus contingent they're all sitting there, maskless, basically going, mm, we've been vaccinated, and literally, you know, uh, uh, um, you know waving their fingers at they us. They shouldn't have been and, there on Christmas Day without masks. Well, I, I know they shouldn't, but yeah, they were absolutely got, refusing to put them on know, because I'll, they felt safe. I'll have the whole of the DH on me saying, when you've been vaccinated, you've got to wait three to four well, weeks. Well, put it this way, <laughs> the, rest of, our, the, the rest of us uh, <laughs> yeah. were very careful. We were wearing our masks. Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> but it was very amusing because they were, it was the confidence no, it, it, factor. No, it is, it is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Now, Simon, you mentioned tourists. I think yeah. I'm sure I'll speak for Nika here. What we'd also like back is a younger audience. We'd like a new audience to come through. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just here to serve an older demographic. Uh, a big focus for us has been to try and get younger and younger people to come into the West End, come and see opera. That's why if you take Lab OM, it was constructed in a slightly... Uh, I'm sure some of the purists wouldn't, wouldn't have appreciated... It was hip. It was hip, hip. and it was modern. And yeah. it will bring into the London Coliseum uh, a younger audience who haven't seen it before, and that may be their stepping stone uh, into a Wagner or a Puccini or something like is that. Is that... We'll, we'll put a link to that if it's still available, La Boheme, is it...? Uh... No, we, we can give you the link. OK, we'll put, we send it round after this, because I'm... It was great, and genuinely. I'll only give you the link if you promise not to sleep while you're watching it, Simon. I definitely won't. That, I didn't sleep the first I, time I when I went. I, I was, it's, well, it's pure really genius. Well, it's really interesting. You're, genius. you're saying he goes to sleep, and you're saying he goes to sleep. No. Should <laughs> we sort the two of you out? No, we, do, we both go to sleep in medical yeah. meetings. That's OK. Uh, That's allowed. OK. So, um, so let, let's... Uh, now, we've got <laughs> other questions coming in that aren't actually COVID-related, which is great. Good. So someone's having a go at your subtitles, I'm afraid. Surtitles. Surtitles, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, they think it should be sub. Uh, well, it's, in, uh, when they came in years ago, which was with Peter Jonas, I think, and George Harwood, my predecessor, it was a huge debate about surtitles. Um, um, I'm, I'm afraid whoever gave it, I'm at that camera there, whoever gave the question, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I probably really. get a letter about surtitles uh, every week. And it's one of these perennial discussions. Um, the other thing we're looking at, if you, if you, I think it's in the Met in New York, it is in the Met, uh, the surtitles on the back of the seat in front of you, which is very expensive. So but it's also quite distracting when you're it watching is very distracting, the stage. I'm very, um, ag I'm very there, against those. There is, there it's is also a distracting with the, with the next person too. Well, there's Don't a bigger that, lobby. Harry. There's a bigger lobby for surtitles than there isn't. If you're saying you only get one a week, that's 52 letters a year. Well, maybe I was exaggerating slightly. No, Every but that's not very much. That's no, not very much. I've, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. I think you're right. So. I, 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 yeah. you know, I, I But uh, interestingly, he does say that because we, we're having a strategy day uh, in June. And one of the points in the discussion, I, and I can't hear where it will go, is whether we should advertise in every run a production without surtitles. So it gives people the option. 
Hmm. Okay. I mean, I have to say, I'm going to confess, I like the surtitles <laughs> because, frankly, quite a lot of the singer's diction is not terribly good. And that's in English. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, can I just say, Nika, we have actually, in the last two years, we have, uh, we have, we have voice coaches and diction coaches on every production, in every rehearsal, and particularly when it comes into the Coliseum out of West Then in that case, Harry, dress. why do you need surtitles? Because, uh, because we do. Don't worry about but me, just keep uh, going. We are, we are working, and I can tell you, it's a, uh, uh, the whole <laughs> debate on diction is a great debate uh, of Martin Brabham's and Annalise. It's a big focus. Because uh, that takes you back to something earlier on. You're about, people come to, you're talking about, is, is it, why do you do it? Is, it? is it for the money? If the product isn't right on stage, people won't come, and then there will be no profit. So the, the product is important. You and mean we the spend show. a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we mean the show. I'm yes. trying to be uh, in opera, but the, the, uh, the show is why people come. Yeah. And, and, and that is the product you're selling, and that's why we're, we're all of us uh, in commercial and opera, you're constantly looking at it, reviewing it, discussing it, debating it, polishing. Is another way to do it? Could we improve it? It's, uh, it's constant debate. Now, Louise here has been a little cheeky. She says, apart from your own productions, which are all brilliant, what, who would you recommend when we go back to, to as we were, as they were, which production not yours? either of yours, would you be recommending? Nika only recommends the Lone Coliseum, and I only recommend... Now, that's Nika cheating, no, and that's um, not allowed. <laughs> I, I think you should try. This is very experimental stuff, yeah. but Sonia Friedman's doing three new plays um, at the Harold Pinter Theatre. There's very good... There's a wonderful team of uh, Ian Rickson with Gemma Arterton. Uh, so I w that's, I'm going to go to that. You're I'm going to go yeah. that season. Um, coming quite soon, it was postponed three times because of COVID. There's a new production of Good with David Tennant, which is a three-hander. And it's been a completely different concept by a very, very good director, oh, Dominic Cook. I went to the Cook. opening of Good. Yeah, well, yeah. this is Dominic Cook, who was, I'm sure some of you remember, was the artistic director at the Royal Court and at the RSC. This is and a C.P. Taylor. Yes. Yeah. And wow, I, I think that this is a fantastic oh. script. I, I mean, that's an absolute must-see, in my view. It's a yeah, Brilliant. and there are some, yeah. some that will be soon. I mean, um, I, I love Come From Away, which is a musical, which they're hoping to come back in July. I would definitely recommend that. That's Canadian, Barbara, you all know it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it's definitely, that. I'd absolutely go and see that. And okay. of course, yeah, I, mean, I can give you a whole the, load the of that. The shut film up is awful, but the play is... I haven't is, seen the oh, film. Well, don't, it's dreadful. So, okay, Harry, your turn. Well, I'm not so I'm not so, uh, I'm not aware of some of the plays, but I mean I've been looking at that. But if I was going to say anything which people would like to see when the shows come back, uh, if you haven't seen it, I'd go and see Hamilton at the Victoria Palace. Oh, okay, fair enough. Which we first saw uh, in New York. Well, that won't be till the autumn. Pardon? That, that won't, won't be till. When's it coming back? Oh, I don't think it'll come back before the autumn. Is it not? It's a big show. It's a big, very big show. But yeah, yeah. you know, Hamilton is a favourite. Mary Poppins is coming back, and Cameron's bringing that over the summer. Um, there's a whole load of fantastic things. And I wasn't going to plug mine, but okay, you might on, be into, not my production, but <laughs> at the Vaudeville Theatre is Constellations with four casts. It's a little love story, all of different ages. And one pair is Zoe Wanamaker and Peter Capaldi at, at their sort of more to going towards their twilight years. You've got uh, Anna Maxwell Martin um, uh, as, the, uh, uh, as a sort of, and Chris O'Dowd, which is a coup. He hardly ever does theatre. That's going, that, all four casts are great, and I would say it's worth having a look at those. And it is in my theatre, but I have not produced it, so that would okay. be on my list. Okay. Well, I'd do a bigger play. recommendation. I, I would like everybody who's listening to go and see everything. <laughs> and keep the theatres busy, and let's get back into the habit of coming out. I was going to end with that, but you've done that, no, <laughs> you've well, done that already. Important. But yeah, okay. Let's let's still. It's good not to talk about COVID. Let's talk about something else serious. We, when we were chatting earlier, um, you made reference back to you, you gave a speech at the Fringe a few years ago about the demise of the critic. Yeah, critics are an endangered species. That's it. Endangered species. Yeah. Well, I think we. Everyone loves a critic when they tell, tell you that you're brilliant and the show's marvellous and you're a fantastic actor. Uh, everyone gets hurt when the reviews are not so positive. However, 
What we, we genuinely do want is proper erudite criticism. And I think that there was a sort of this time when the critics were feeling very vulnerable because so many blogs and posts were mm. popping up where the it was everyone has an opinion, but the erudite opinion is quite an important part of the process of the play or the show from the start to the end. And um, I remember many years ago, there was a, a Times critic that was brought in who was not, was not doing very well. And he finally shot himself in the foot when Richard Eyre did a most fantastic production of Guys and Dolls. Oh, yeah. Choreographed by Bob David Hoskins. Tukori. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in the review, the mm. Times critic said, where on earth did they find this old musical that's, that is so terrible? And it's like everyone's going, <clears throat> you know nothing. And there was this huge protest and he was gone. And quite rightly. Well, and yeah, I've been definitely. very well behaved because I haven't actually outed the name. Uh, we'll find out. We'll find out. But uh, no, that's that's. Yeah. I've always thought when you go to, when you have great music and poor 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 li lyrics or libretto, you're probably at the opera. But when you have great music and great li lyrics, you're probably at Guys and Dolls, yeah. you know, or a great musical. Sorry. Well, to say there are some a lot of very great yeah. musicals. Yeah. So, but but critics are they are diminishing, aren't they? I mean, it was yeah. said that was it was it Frank Rich, in, in America could could close could <laughs> close a show in a night. We've, we've never had anyone who does that here. No. And also, you can't close shows overnight like you really can in America. How, how, and can, how can you close it in America? Because the, the union rules allow for that, is no. that you can put a play on, you get the bad reviews, and you come in the next day and say to everybody, that's it, I'm closing it. Here, you have to do at least uh, two weeks. You have to give notice to the actors oh, and everything. Oh. You can't do that. But no producer would close somewhere early here. They mm -hmm. do everything and working with the theatre owner to, to kind of uh, curtail its run, but to do so in an elegant and kind way. And I, I'm all for that. I mean, yeah, no, sure. we, we can hide, you know, we're very good at, but, at but hiding our shame when the show hasn't worked. Well, Simon, critics are part of the life. Right? Yeah. They're part, they're every stage, you know, the world's a stage, and they, they are part of the actors. You know, every man and woman, and every man, woman and critic has their role to play. They are part of it. Uh, yeah. So I haven't got a problem with critics. They've occasionally had a problem with me, but I've <laughs> never had a problem with them. It's their job to express their view. Yeah. And, um, and, and you don't have that drama here. Uh, again, speaking purely for the Coliseum, uh, we have an expectation of what our advance would be. Uh, we've never had a run on the bank. We've had a, if we've had a poor review, we've never had so no, but you, stampeding. You can probably have back. a bit of a setback, though if it's from a really, really respected critic. I mean, the point about critics is also to recommend things to the audience. And there was so much choice in London, so much wonderful things. Yeah. I have a few critics who I trust. So I love Dominic. Yeah, well, I loved, no, but then I look at them and if, if they go, this is brilliant, I would, I would probably more likely to go. So is I like Dominic okay Maxwell the Times people. and okay. <laughs> uh, Dominic Cavendish and the Telegraph. I think yeah. they're both excellent critics. Um, Stephen Armstrong in the, for comedy and other uh, sort of more of more kind of hip stuff in the um, Sunday Times. And, and it helps me decide what to go and see. And if you read the critics, because you go a lot, you'll find the one that, whose taste matches yours. And then you actually have a really good time seeing all the shows you you go having a good suppose, time I each time. I suppose from my point of view, the only time we get, um, you know, we half and puff a bit is when a critic, as opposed to an arts correspondent, will sometimes make reference to the way, because we're publicly funded to a degree, but they make reference to the way the place is managed or the way the place is governed. Mm -hmm. And because, in fact, they may not quite understand the complexities, the details of how it actually runs and the, and the actual costs which are required. But other than that, uh, we have no problem for critics. But so I you do have a problem, though, because are you saying that by making those kind of criticisms, it's detrimental to the organisation? No, we, we just get upset on the daily. Oh, OK, that's but, fine. But, you know, I don't, that's uh, fine. I don't lose sleep. No, 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 no. of course. We, well, we're all uh, sensitive. Only about we're about all sensitive. Well, wasn't, though, your point also that now everyone is a critic on social yeah, media? Yeah, yeah. That, there's, there's, that actually, whether they write or... That, that, people are going to go yeah. not because of what they've read in The Observer or The Telegraph. Well, no. that's what I'm saying, is that the 
the very uh, the history of great criticism we have in the UK is worth something. It really is, and uh, and I would be very sorry to see it go. And with costs uh, cutting all the time, you know, a lot of the critics now they're not on a staff contract. They're no, all free. No. Even the best ones are freelance, and they're under a great deal of pressure. And um, I see them coming to the theatre, and they're trying to juggle so many shows and get their reviews in and I I actually think it's it's an important art good writing knowledgeable criticism okay. that's a good thing now so Joe except McMahon's, when they give me bad reviews yeah, well, <laughs> Joe McMahon has said that uh, sir titles are a fantastic invention I like him Do you, <laughs> you like him already I thought you would no I like them all oh okay now listen if you know things would improve if there's no debate okay yeah. and actually just just Thinking also, we just briefly mentioned the difference between America and the US, and you've also at another time spoken about the difference in the way we treat comedy. Yes. You've, uh, yes. You, I think you've, what sounds almost like a paradox, that comedy over here is a very serious business. Yes, um, it was, um, for those, I, I have long been long associated with comedy because um, I run and own what, with the Perrier Awards now, the Emma Comedy Awards, yeah. so I've been doing it for a very long time. And um, it really struck home when a young comedian some years ago, Bo Burnham, who some of you will know because he's the good guy in Promising, Promising Young Woman, the current Oscar-nominated film. Mm -hmm. And um, he'd started singing his own comedy songs in his bedroom at the age of 14 and putting them out on the internet. And he came to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and did a fantastic show. And uh, he won one of the awards. And he said, and it just, we, we, so, we so are so sort of used to it. He said, you, it's incredible what you, you guys get over here. In America, no one reviews comedy. And no one reviews comedy the way your critics do with an understanding of it. They can talk about timing and they can talk about material. They can talk about, talk about the comedian's character. He said, it's an honor to actually have us taken seriously and we do take it for granted and it was like you're right and you know here we are in the UK we have the most amazing comedy industry uh, starting with stand-up which feeds into theatre film television and when you think you know what say um, Steve Coogan's done he won the Perry Award back in 1992 and here he is making major major Hollywood movies writing starring in them uh, you have uh, lo all over the television schedules, the comedians move on to writing sitcoms. And I always remember uh, a playwright who started off as a comic, found his voice as a playwright, but I watched him trying to see what his voice was as a comedian, and that was Patrick Marber, who wrote Closer. So uh, it's an incredible um, breeding ground for talent in this country, because the thing about stand-up is that the audience tells you whether you've got it right or wrong. Yeah. And it's that listening to an audience that makes them actually very good writers and for plays as well and films and movies because they get that feedback live every night and they all talk about the whole thing of dying. You have to go through the standing on stage and having absolute no response and that way you really learn your craft. It's a brutal but really effective way of doing it. I'm a huge fan of comedians. And when they, comedians who can act, some of you may have seen the Pinter season, Jamie Lloyd's Pinter season not very long ago. And there was an extraordinary performance from the comedian Lee Evans. Harold Pinter loved Lee Evans. Because the thing about comics is that they are also deep down here the greatest tra tragedians. They understand about the human condition really well. They write about it and talk about it. So, yeah, I mean, I think the comedy industry has put a lot into uh, the whole mix of uh, entertainment in the UK. Which is why Jonathan Miller was yeah, such a successful director exactly. and part of the, the great heritage of it, you know. Yes. And, that, and he was and started he... out in Cambridge Foot Lights along with Alan Bennett. Yes. Yeah. Well, not, not actually a funny man, though, Jonathan. Although, is he? He's not very... Very well, serious. Well, I, I, well I, I know we've got a medical audience. One of the yeah. perks of my last seven years, I mean, he's passed away now. Yeah, indeed. But because I was a medic, uh, he made a bit, you know, he, he, he came looking for me. 
And one of the greatest thrills was three or four lunches at the Ivy, one to one with Jonathan Miller as an older man. And he could entertain, he could yeah. be a comedy. And yeah, he you really said something could. quite correct, you didn't realize, Simon. Uh, comedy is the most serious of businesses. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and he then talked about some of his skits going right back to Edinburgh in the early 60s. And he was analyzing them as if you're looking at a blood test. You, know. you just look at that year, that year of, the, of um, Beyond the Fringe. 61, yeah. um, yeah. of, of the talent, Peter Cook. Uh, David Moore, um, Jonathan, Jonathan, Alan, yeah, Bennett, the, Alan Bennett. Then yeah. the next glorious year, which was 1981, Footlights, Stephen Fry, yeah. Emma Thompson, Hugh Laurie. Rowan Atkinson. Uh, Rome Atkinson wasn't in that troupe, no. but later. But that year, every single one of them gold. And, um, you know, we forget that Emma Thompson started off doing sketches because she just whizzed into the stratosphere yeah. so fast, doing everything, actually. No, I remember that from my university days. And Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry turned out to be a very good actor, too. I once wrote to Mr. Miller, when, you know, Dr. Miller, when he had had a piece, he was sometimes irascible, moaning about the fact what he really would like to do would be to run a small neuropsychiatry <laughs> service and uh, do a little bit of research. So I wrote to him and said, well, I do that. I would love to produce opera at La Scala. Why don't we swap jobs? Oh, that's very funny. He didn't reply. <laughs> I don't think he thought, he it was thought oh, some madman probably. <laughs> yes, I know it is what I did. Yeah. Anyway, so listen, we're coming to, towards the end. And um, first of all, can you just stay where you are? Because I have to just make a couple of announcements for everyone, which I've now gone and completely lost and forgotten. Um, but where are we? What have I got to say? Um, <laughs> what fire exits or something? No, no, you stay where you are. You just stay where you are. Um, no, God, I have lost it. Anyway, so what I normally have to say is to remind everyone that um, the RSM has not suffered anything as badly as the cultural sector has, but we've also been struggling during this time. So everybody watching, do remember, please donate to us and, uh, and you'll soon be able to come back. May the 17th, we will definitely be here. And this time next week, um, Roger Kirby will be interviewing, I assume, on, on this stage again. Are we sticking with uh, the, this format? I hope we are. Um, he's interviewing, um, he's interviewing, uh, I've now actually forgotten who he's interviewing, but it's someone incredibly well known, but not as well known as, as you are. Yes. And with any luck, Roger, Roger will now Let's be cursing. Somebody. He will be swearing, yes. It's, it's Rowan Atkinson, actually. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not Rowan yeah. Atkinson. Well, uh, that would be yeah. fun if it that were would, Rowan Atkinson. Yes, it would be, yeah. Spontaneity is all about rehearsals. Yeah. It, it is, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I, I don't, I really honestly don't know who it is. We, we've been trying to get Boris Johnson for a while. I'm but very that's... glad you didn't go to La Scala now. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's true. No, OK. Oh, it's Bertie Lee, who's Bertie a, Lee. a legal, a well-known legal yes, eagle. I'm sure you know Bertie. I do, so yeah. You do, yeah. yeah. And then Mark Britton all the week after. Yeah. And our COVID series also continues. That's at lunchtimes on Thursdays. And uh, that I do know, Marcel Liebe will be uh, chairing a, a discussion, who's the head of UCL, on its way back to Holland now to run their medical system. And we'll be talking about clots, blood clots and vaccines. Lovely. Very trendy. And unfortunately well, very terrible. interesting. Yeah. Does no, anyone know should, anything about it? them? <laughs> um, Marcel does, and okay. that's why we've got him. And then we'll have our, our um, monthly roundup table with the old lags, uh, Oppenshaw, Mitchie, and Shattuck, who everyone who follows us knows very well. In we'll my year there. at Guys. Is that Peter Oppenshaw, sure, isn't yes, it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Another contemporary of mine. Yeah. We, we knew the crisis was over when, for the first time, Peter smiled. Because yeah. he had not, for the he first time. He seems to do all this TV of, stuff from his he, bedroom, oh, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But he'd been miserable for the first six months of the, of when we were doing these. And then there was this magical moment when he smiled and all our audience, about two, 3,000, went completely mad. Said, oh my God, Oppenshaw smiled. It's going to be okay. Well, can I say, <laughs> I, it was in my year at Guy's, he was a smiley medical student. That's why I remember him. <laughs> well, I don't think he was for the first bits of the pandemic. Anyway, yeah. now then, back to you two. Thank, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for coming on. It's been absolutely brilliant, and there have been lots of very, very nice comments. They're not always and nice. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who has tuned yep. in to listen. Very good of you. No, that's true. And, and I hope not too many of you left during the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, yeah, but but it, it, I mean, it is really important, because there are some people who have enjoyed the, the lockdown, but I don't think there are people who ever go... Not for to, this long, really. Well, one or two have, yeah. One wow. or two have, but... They're clearly not people who go to football, theatre, culture, music, or all the or things. Or like socialising. Well, speaking of that, I can tell you, the people. chorus and the orchestra and our regular freelancers 
they are just desperate to get back on stage yeah. Yeah. and rehearse. And it's tough. If you take the orchestra, they rehearse together and they were just so keen to either get back and play, even under socially distant circumstances. Absolutely. So, and what everyone can do is buy tickets. Yes, Absolutely. please. They're available now. Buy tickets. Bring your mobile with you. And, um, and I'm definitely... Nine Max Theatre's website. <laughs> okay, that's good. Sorry, I'm being we'll, shameless. No, no, we will pass that round. We'll yeah. definitely, well, the least we can do. Thank you both for coming. Thank you, it's been and great. thank you. And thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good.